Hi, and welcome to the Special Situations cast. My name is Branda Haas. I run the Special Situations report, which you can find on Sydney Alpha. Um, before we jump into the interview with my guests of today, I want to make a few things clear. Uh, nothing on this uh, show is investment advice. Um, it's for entertainment purposes. Either me or my guests may have positions in any stocks or uh, securities that we discuss. So keep that in mind and please go and enjoy my uh, interview of today. Uh, today, my guest is um, James Royale. He's um, currently at Red Ventures and an author at Bankrate. I think what's especially relevant to today's discussion is that um, uh, James, you led a special situations investment effort at the Motley Fool. Um, you just released a book called The Zen of Thrift Conversions, and that's why uh, I invited you, and I'm very excited to talk to you about that. Um, hi, James. Welcome. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me, Brad. Yeah, no, it's uh, my pleasure. Uh, could you uh, tell the viewers in a nutshell what your uh, new book is about? Yeah, so it's uh, The Zen of Thrift Conversions, uh, and it's basically every, the book covers investing in thrift conversions through every step of the process. Uh, you know, a thrift um, is a, a, a name for, or an alternative name for a mutually owned bank, uh, a bank that's owned by its depositors technically. And uh, when these things go public, uh, basically they are, they come public at a discount, almost uh, by their very nature, by the very setup, the a quirk of this kind of process. And so the book talks about how you can make money uh, being a depositor, participating in the IPO, um, how you can invest in different types of conversions, the types of things you need to look for to find attractive banks. And then uh, a lot of the uh, back half of the book discusses thrift activist investors. So uh, guys who are, uh, who, their living is going after these banks, making sure that they um, uh, work on behalf of all shareholders and don't just self-deal. And so I talk about thrift activism and then have interviews, full-length interviews with three of the major uh, players in the activist space and thrift activists. And these guys are fantastic. The interviews are phenomenal yeah i uh, totally agree these were uh, super enjoyable and um yeah i'll uh, ask you for uh, some stories uh, later um i was wondering um, um what made you what made you so interested in um in uh, thrifts or why do they fascinate fascinate you so, so much? sure so uh when i was at the motley fool i was really engaged in special situations um, and so thrift conversions are a little bit of an off the radar, even uh, special situations. Spinoffs get a lot of love from investors. Uh, thrifts, uh, much less so. And some of that, of course, is potentially what spells opportunity for investors. They tend to be relatively small. The financials don't look particularly attractive at first glance, uh, but they're, you know, perhaps counterintuitively, there is a good uh, long-term track record uh, here. Uh, approximately 70% of these thrifts eventually get bought out uh, by a rival. And so all of that is really interesting. And it's, there's, there's a, the appeal of investing in your, the bank across the street um, or finding something that's this kind of oddball stock that's out of the way, that's a, a micro cap or, you know, what I, what I sometimes call even a nano cap, right? Uh, what, 20, are small, what are like the smallest uh, market caps that you come across? Right. I mean, some, every once in a while you get something that's 15 million here, right? Oh, 10 cool. to 15 million, which is really on the low end. A lot of these guys are, uh, you know, 30 to 50 million. Uh, and then you get some larger than that. So um, the... Part of what's interesting, though, too, is that there's this repeatable process. It, it, it happens again and again and again. And so uh, by looking at thrift conversions as a sort of subsector, uh, it's an attractive place to look for stocks that might be undervalued. And so 
you know, you want to set yourself up as an investor for, you know, I, I use the metaphor in the book, the, uh, a fishing hole, right? It's like you, you keep going to the fishing hole that delivers fish. And uh, this is a great one to go look. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, you've um, convinced me again with the, the book. <laughs> I, I really, really enjoyed it. I was uh, I researched a little bit uh, what, what you did, and um, I, I think you have a background in uh, philosophy. And um, I was thinking, may, if I had to guess what your favorite book is, maybe it's Siddhartha from Herman Hesse. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, actually, I've, I've read that book. I've taught that book. Uh, yeah, Hesse is fantastic. Okay. And uh, um, yeah, the uh, so actually, uh, I have a PhD in literature from the University of Florida. And uh, actually, my dissertation uh, discusses sort of the emergence of uh, Buddhist representations in American culture. But yeah, but I'm definitely sort of... Uh, thinking along philosophical lines. Yeah, and that's, uh, you call it like the, the Zen of thrift conversions, and it, it plays into, of course, the whole Zen of motorcycle. Uh, I, I forgot what the exact title is, but I thought I, it, it probably has to do something with your affinity for, uh, for philosophy or... Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely, and, right? And so a lot of, when, when I talk about, when I call it the Zen of thrift conversions, I'm really talking about hey, let's understand how these things actually work, right? How they operate, how they can make money for investors so that you uh, just ultimately so that you can see how they function and how, how you might be able to make money, right? And so that's, to me, that's what everything, you just observe these things closely and figure out uh, how they operate. Yeah, and I also really liked uh, that title because I've tried investing in these and you you have to be really sent to do it because <laughs> it's it's just it's such a quiet um there's little volatility they, there's no news and you just sit there for the longest time you think there's nothing happening and and right. but if you sell out too early that that doesn't work so um yeah i liked it in that sense yeah, I, and there's definitely, I think you're right, there's, these are really pretty low volatility stocks for the most part. Uh, it's, uh, you'll get often high volatility on day one, right, where these things come out of the gate 20% um, up, sometimes 25% up. There was one in 2017, one of the most highly followed ones, uh, PCSB, where it was up 65% on day one. Uh, and that, su such a high gain is unusual, but definitely 20, 25% is not uh, um, uh, unusual at all. And, but you're right, after that, they can float around for a while. Um, but, uh, you know, on these, if you buy a 10 or $12 stock and you're looking for 13, 15% annual gain, which is certainly possible with, with thrifts, um, you know, that maybe is only a couple points every year. Right. Yeah. Uh, and if you look at the charts on a lot of these, it's very slow and steady, slow and steady, slow and steady. And then often when these guys uh, surpass year three, which is when they can be acquired after year three, they can be acquired yeah, and let's, by arrival. Let's maybe uh, just explain what a, what a thrift conversion is, because I think sure. we, we forgot to, uh, to do that. <laughs> sure. So, so, uh, in a thrift conversion, um, what, what happens is you take uh, what are often sort of small town community banks that are mutually owned by their depositors and you take them public, all right? So the interesting thing here is uh, it, it's this real anachronistic situation, this mutual ownership, right? So technically in these mutuals, they are mutually owned by their depositors. The depositors own the capital in the bank, the book value in the bank. Um, that really doesn't mean very much until the bank is public or is thinking about going public. Yeah, right? before they can you, take as, it out. Right, you can't take that capital out, right? And uh, in the old days, it was a little bit different, but basically in this modern, modern era, the way you get to access that capital in any real sense is when the bank goes public, the mutual goes public, and then investors as a group get to access that capital. That's to say they get it for free by effectively recapitalizing the bank. They, they typically buy in at $10 a share, 
And often what they're getting is a bank with $15 a share or $17 a share, sometimes $20 a share in uh, tangible book value per share. So, you know, it's not unusual for, for investors to be able to buy into these at 50%, 60%, 70%, 80% of the capital that's in the bank. So, so that's the quirk is basically um, uh, you put up some money and I give you your money back plus, you know, a little bit of extra. And uh, so that's, that's the real interesting situation. And um, so these mutuals can really kind of go public in a couple different ways. One is the standard or single step conversion. Um, and another way is the two step conversion. Yeah. And so we can get into that, but there's a couple different ways that they, they can go public. And, um, yeah, and there's like, I think, um, the returns, I, the way you describe them in a the book, they're pretty good. Um, it's a waiting game. Uh, and if you like the bad ones, you're just waiting for too long. That's how they go bad. And the, the good ones, it go, the whole process is quick. Um, maybe. Do you, do you see like any opportunity to, to dif differentiate um, before, before going through the whole thing? Sure. So um, one of the things I lay out, one of the things I lay out in the book is a, sort of a nine step checklist um, to help you identify uh, things, at least at, at least at a high level that are, are going to be particularly attractive to an acquirer. Um, so but like you said, a lot of these, uh, it's not unusual for these three months, six months after they've crossed that three-year moratorium to get an offer, right, from a rival bank. And, you know, basically, as, as uh, Joe Stilwell uh, said, and you can read this in the interview, is he basically says, I've never come across a bank that someone didn't want to play suitor to it, right? So um, the... Um, so there's a nine step checklist that I have in the book that runs through some of the key elements that uh, you, that an acquirer would likely find attractive things like the deposit franchise, right? How much is held in those core non-time deposits that are stickier, that are more valuable for an acquiring bank, right? How, um, and certainly for us as investors, we're looking for insider ownership here, right? That helps align uh, management with us as outsiders, um, and certainly in these small thrifts, uh, there can be quite a bit of self-dealing. And so you want those managers aligned with you as much as possible. You know, presence of an activist is another great sign. Um, you know, stocks, one of the striking things about these mutuals is they come out just loaded with cash, right? So equity to assets, so the ratio of equity to assets might be 15%, might be 20%, right? these come out and they're so, they're almost unsinkable uh, with all that cash that they've got. Just today, uh, Eastern Bank Corp, uh, Eastern Bank Shares is uh, uh, completed its IPO. It's now public um, and it has 23%, 22, 23% equity to assets, right? Um, so that's a great sign. That gives the bank uh, a lot of room to repurchase stock, which is another sign, right? Um, are they going to repurchase stock? Uh, how much? And that's a great value driver uh, for, uh, and a great low risk value driver for investors here. You know, we look at tangible book value. Again, for example, Eastern um, uh, at, at its IPO price was about 66% of tangible book value. So just to get to a some some ballpark multiple that is reasonable, like 100 percent of tangible book value, you've got upside of 50 percent there. So um, you know those are some of the factors that I look at um, to try to get comfortable. Cool, and um, maybe um, then the the one step process and the two step process. Uh, yeah, that's basically the two segments that you describe. Uh, yeah, can you get into that a little bit? Yeah, so this is this is this is a little bit where it starts to get uh, hairy, right? Everybody can sort of understand the IPO process uh, in, in general, right? And uh, I'll say that uh, I'll throw in a, a neat bit of this is that uh, insiders 
really are on the same side as outsiders here. There's no information asymmetry. So normally in an IPO, you've got uh, outsiders selling their stock to, um, to or sorry, insiders selling their stock to outsiders, right? Yeah. So um, there's, you, you got to think a little bit, why are these, if this is such a great opportunity, why are these guys selling their stock to me? And uh, that's not the case in a mutual conversion, right? All the money that's raised goes to the bank. And in fact, there's, a, there's some incentive because the insiders, the bank directors, the bank managers get to buy on the same terms that uh, the outsiders do. They're also interested in kind of keeping that price down. So they might tend to um, push, uh, push the valuation on the IPO toward the lower end. And so there are two ultimate ways, sort of to get back a little to your question, there are two ways that you can do that uh, and go public. Uh, the standard or single step conversion, which uh, as you might guess, is uh, the whole thing. They 100% of the stock in the mutual goes out to the public, one fell swoop, and it's public. And uh, this is much simpler for investors to understand. Um, and uh, again, these typically uh, come off at a valuation well below tangible book value. Um, and it, it's just simple to understand. It's fully public. And uh, at that point, uh, you've got, there's a one year moratorium on dividends and buybacks. And you, you ultimately, uh, at the end of the one year period, you want to see them announcing uh, some type of buyback, um, typically if they're, if they're uh, substantially below tangible book value. In the three year period, um, they can be bought out by a rival. Um, oh, yeah. So the first three years, they can be bought out. Right, exactly. After okay. Right, and so, um, and so one of the things that you'll see on these, like on these uh, ones that, on standard conversions when they, um, you'll start to see a pickup six to eight months out before that pickup in the stock price, six to eight months out before that three year period. And so they'll sort of really start to tick up around that as the market starts to build in um, some expectations um, uh, of an offer that might be on the table. And more so if you've got an activist in there and more so still, if you've got an activist who says, I want to get this bank sold. Um, so, so that's a, that's a first step conversion. The, the two step conversion, uh, it gets, uh, kind of hairy. Um, the basically like its name implies, it goes public in two steps. Uh, first step, they sell a minority, uh, position in the stock, typically around 45% of the stock. The, the majority share, uh, is non-publicly traded and it's held by a mutual holding company um that sort of sort of kind uh kind of represents the interests of the mutual depositors so they sell just uh one portion uh the minority shares out into the public um and often those can come off at well well below 50 percent of partially converted tangible book value um, and uh, there's sort of multiple reasons for that um, which we can get into later, but no, man, the, it really screws up like all the screeners. And, um, so, uh, very few people are aware of those. Um, sure. It, yeah. Exactly. It, when you look at the thing is when you look at these two step conversions on any type of traditional value screens, or even if you just do a cursory glance at the valuation, right? You go to a Yahoo finance or whatever, or your broker, and it's going to say it, these are trading, you know, two to three times more expensive than they are. If you look at the uh, PE ratio or a price to tangible book, they're going to look tremendously expensive. And you think, why is anybody going to pay this, uh, pay this amount for, uh, for this bank that where the financials might, might be good, but might often not look so good. And so part of the reason or the reason is uh, because uh, of this really strange structure. Um, they count in, in public filings even, they count the entire share count, even though they've only sold about, uh, sold a minority stake in, uh, in the bank. And so uh, you can already see the disconnect, right? Yeah. So they've raised capital in some, but they're, you know, the denominator in these calculations is figuring uh, the entire share count. 
later on when they complete the second step, when they do the second step of the, of the offering and become a fully public bank, they'll sell those shares out into the market uh, and pull in more capital uh, into the bank. And so th that's something that really keeps and uh, is it investors possible that, away. That the, the second step just doesn't happen or doesn't happen for like ages? Right. And that, that's, certainly, that's certainly a concern is that there's really no timeline on when the second step uh, can happen. I mean, unless, unless the bank really needs the capital for some reason, it can sort of stay in there. <laughs> that's almost not good either. Uh, right, right. And then, it, then it's like, well, I, do I really want my bank raising capital when it needs to raise capital um, uh, and diluting shareholders and whatnot, right? So one that, I, the one that I've looked at uh, extensively is TFS Financial, right? So it's been public since uh, 2007, I believe, and uh, uh, it did its first step. And uh, the CEO has come out and it's his sort of family company. The CEO has come out and said, you know, I'm not doing it as the CEO. Uh, it's going to be up to my children. So um, it could be a, a quite a long process. That said, on average, these do the sec these second, these two step conversions complete the second step uh, in about five years. Um, and then from that point, there's another three years until uh, their buyout bait, right? Um, so if that's your end game as an investor, then those second step conversions are definitely a slower process to get there. And now um, which of the two do you prefer or which is your? Uh, so I would, I would say I prefer the standard conversion. There's a shorter timeline uh, on seeing, seeing fair value uh, on the investment. And, um, you know, the standard conversion could take a while. That said, um, once the, once the, sorry, the, the two-step conversion could take a while. Uh, but that said, once they complete the second step, the, the bank is fully public. So it's in that respect, just like a standard conversion, which is also fully public or, you know, any fully public out, uh, bank out there on the market. So um, that's, um, you know, it's, at some point that kind of equalizes. But I like the standard conversions because it's, as I say, because it's faster um, and, um, uh, the the second step, or the, sorry, the two step allows uh, a management team to stick around longer, uh, to uh, potentially get uh, some more uh, lucrative uh, uh, years as running the bank, uh, and uh, it allows them to potentially time their exit uh, from the bank uh, more more closely, and uh, and there's other legitimate reasons like. As I said, when these uh, conversions uh, go public, when these thrifts go public, they have tons of capital, right? And so the standard conversion, it just kind of dumps it all in at once, right? Whereas with a, with a two-step, uh, they give them a little bit of capital now. Maybe they can put that to work in loans, repurchases, whatnot, and, um, and then more on the second step. But one of the really kind of neat things here about the two-step, though, is if you buy after the first step, after the first step conversion, as a public, um, as a public investor, you can own all the economics of that business, right? And so, for example, uh, one of my uh, favorite situations, TFS Financial, um, they pay a dividend, right? And a very attractive dividend. Um, basically the entire, the economics of the entire bank are owned by just 18% of the shares. So as you can imagine, uh, if I can get a lot of the earnings power paid out as a dividend, uh, and yet that's only being paid really to 18% of shareholders, uh, that's a much larger dividend than you would otherwise expect or than you could otherwise earn. So, you know, one of the strange things like we talked about before is that doesn't show up on the screens, right? It looks like, hey, how's this bank paying out a dollar ten a year when it's only earning thirty cents a year? How this dividend must be unsustainable, uh, but right. it is. And you move on to the next one. Sure. Right. Yeah. yeah. You just all right. This is looks like it's trading at two hundred and fifty percent of tangible book value. Um, it looks like it's trading at fifty times earnings. Who wants this dog? 
And, uh, but, you know, in fact, it's got a sustainable dividend. You look at it, it the PE on a partially converted basis is, is 10 times, right? The book value is really, uh, uh, the, sorry, the price to book value is really 50%, sometimes less. So. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think if I um, understand you correctly, the, the one step is preferable, but I, I'm guessing that the two step probably trades a lot lower. And if it's low enough, you, you can hold, you can hold it. Right. Um, yeah. That's, given a, that's the a situation right, that's, if management is too bad. And right. That's exactly right. Uh, so ultimately uh, if you're buying these, you're buying these first step conversions, they really often do come off at a serious discount uh, to, to, uh, uh, their uh, partially converted tangible book value, right? It's not unusual for these things to come off at 40% of tangible book value. Um, yeah. Part of that is investors are worried about the overhang of future share issuance, right? When, this, when it does a second step, how's it gonna be valued? And how's that gonna value my shares? And will I be paying actually a lot more than I think I'm paying uh, because of, of dilution and whatnot? So. Um, I, there's some of that, but again, it, if I'm paying 40% of partially converted tangible book value, that, that's going to require a pretty substantial dilution for me to have paid too much, I think. It's, so it's, it, at some point, there's the question of uh, how much has the market over discounted uh, that share issuance, right? But like you said, the first step conversions, when they, when they come public, tend to be the cheapest of the lot standard conversions tend to be middle of the road and second step uh, conversions where the bank goes fully public tend to be priced a little bit higher. But in general, all these still come off at a discount to, to tangible book. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, um, you know, I told you before uh, we went live that I've tried this strategy a few years ago or, mm. or maybe not as consciously as I'll go after the strategy, but I just invested in a couple of these. And um, it's it's actually, I find it really hard because um, uh, it takes a long time and it seems like nothing's happening. And because I'm located outside of the United States, you know, I'm not familiar with these uh, uh, small banks or uh, brands or uh, you can't walk over there. It, we don't even have that phenomenon here. It's just a few uh, major banks. And um, and the financials are horrible. You discuss this in your in your book. The returns on equity are not good. Returns on assets are bad. Um, yeah. So so what's your strategy to um, to deal with that? Is sure. So um, and it's great that you bring up you know how ugly these things look. The financials it, it's un, un, undebatable. Uh, not in every case, but in many cases. And the smaller the bank. Uh, the less likely it is. Well, I to do be. invest in much worse things, like uh, you know, <laughs> no my really big loss. They're not huge losers or um, things that are cratering because value investors do that as well. And these are just very unimpressive. Yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, I mean, the, the 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 track record here is good. It, it, it's there's there's definitely real potential here. But you look at the financials, and you might not see that, right? So no. one of the important things is to remember is that there's this in the U.S. for the last almost the last 40 years, it's a long-term super trend of consolidation uh, in the industry, right? You you had uh, I don't 20,000 banks, 20,000 financial institutions, uh, 30 35 40 years ago. You're now down to 5,000, right? So it's consolidation. The economics of consolidation are tremendously attractive and thrifts are absolutely part of that, right? And sort of perversely, the more poorly run the thrift is, again, within certain limits, the more, the more poorly the thrift is run, the more attractive it is as a buyout candidate, right? Because you can come in uh, as an acquirer and, and cut the costs, boost the ROE um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, thrift activist Rich Lashley estimates is that, you know, acquire, an acquirer can come in and, and slash costs by 25 to 50%, right? And so the PE, the PE that you think you're paying uh, with, uh, as a standalone bank, it might be, you know, in doubly inflated 
uh, for an acquirer, strategic acquirer, you can come in, slash those costs, integrate the bank, bring its tech capacity in, uh, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, if, that, that's, mean, part, that's part of the thing to remember, I think, with these is that it's not, it's be, because it's a buyout play, you need to think like an acquirer would see it and see the value that they would have. Right, yeah, and I, with the market caps you mentioned earlier, um, I think, you know, just re regulatory compliance uh, you can, uh, you know, half that, and um, that's already a big difference. I'm not sure about the U.S. situation, but in, uh, I think that's why there are no small banks in Europe, or not in uh, outside of Germany. Yeah, it's it's uh, the the U.S. banking uh, situation is tremendously fragmented, right? I mean, obviously you've got your big banks that hold 80% of the assets. You know, your top four or five or six banks that have 80% of the assets. Then you've got like literally thousands of institutions that own just a, a, a tiny little share. And, you know, it's funny that you mentioned uh, that uh, you haven't heard of these banks because most people haven't heard, most people in the U.S. Are, have never heard of these banks, right? Okay. And so they, they operate in one or two communities or, you know, only in one state. Um, so th they are really small. And, you know, part of, part of that... Um, especially if you're opening a deposit account and you're sending money to a bank that you've never actually seen in person, you're sending your money three states over, you're like, oh, I, I don't know whether that's a good thing. And, uh, you know, they're all tracked by the FDIC. And so, you know, there's nobody's getting away with anything here. So. Um. <laughs> cool. Um, now, something that I uh, was, was a little bit uh, worried about is, uh, with the whole COVID-19 situation, um, a lot of um, um, SMEs are struggling. Um, those are borrowing from these banks. Um, how, how do you feel about that uh, background? Yeah, so uh, again, uh, you know, one of the things that's interesting about banks, of course, is that they tend to have long-term fee in or, you know, long-term streams of cash flow given, given uh, their loans. And so um, I, that's not something that particularly concerns me with a lot of thrifts uh, because a lot of the thrifts that do, uh, that um, remain standing are heavily focused on uh, the lower risk end of the loan spectrum, right? There's lots of residential one to four uh, family loans. Uh, they, they, they tend not to be on the riskier side with commercial and construction loans. Uh, you know, a few a of them. Big in the shale, uh, shale oil or things like that. Right, right, right. These thrifts are not, I mean, this isn't the 80s when the, when the, when the thrift industry went wild and invested in all types of risky stuff. They're tremendously uh, conservatively run today. And, you know, if you're invested in owner-occupied properties, that's about as safe as it can be. And I think, too, there's a little bit of a sense um, or could be some sense in the market today that, well, um, generals are already fight, or, pardon me, generals are always fighting the last war, right? And so there's a situation which investors are worried about another 2008 to 2009, which for many banks extended into 2010, 2011, 2012. Um, we're not really seeing that, certainly not yet. Um, and a lot of the banks, as I say, are conservatively, conservatively run by nature um, uh, and are already over-reserving. And uh, so, sure. Uh, yeah, I actually didn't check. They develop, but, you, but you didn't have like a huge uh, March drawdown in uh, thrifts or, uh, uh, or right. maybe just March and then recovered or how did that go? Yeah, the uh, you mean in terms of the prices or? Yeah, I was just uh, wondering. So no, prices have actually come down quite a bit. I mean, I just yeah. saw a figure the other day that something like 75% of uh, thrifts are trading below tangible book value, uh, or sorry, not thrifts, but banks, uh, banking yeah. institutions are trading below tangible book value, which was more than what you saw during the financial crisis, right? And I think, hey, that sounds like a pretty interesting opportunity if the losses aren't going to be as bad, uh, you know, the loan losses aren't going to be as bad as they were 10 or 12 years ago. And again, in the case of many of these thrifts, 
they're sitting on 12% equity to assets, 15% equity to assets. And as I said, in some cases, 20% equity to assets. And so, um, you know, even if they have to take some losses, then they're not going to be, uh, it's not going to be, uh, it's not an existential crisis for these guys. And, yeah. um, you know, and we haven't seen the run up in house prices like we saw 15 years ago. So there's less reason to believe that those assets are already inflated. Right. Well, th well thank, thanks. That's great, uh, great background. Um, and um, yeah, I, you know, I'm uh, playing a little bit of an advocate of the devil role here, sure. but uh, what, what do you view as like main risks if, uh, if you um, uh, pick this up as an um, um, investment strategy? Yeah, so um, I think the, probably the, the main risk here is uh, management self-dealing. Uh, you get, um, uh, if, the, if, the, if the loan book is profitable, you're not seeing, you know, serious non-performing assets. You've already got a slug of capital, a huge amount of capital in the bank. Uh, and, you know, if you're buying below tangible book value, um, that, it's going to be hard to lose money on that. Um, the, so I think really the biggest reason, the biggest sort of risk here um, is management self-dealing out of these small thrifts. It, they, and think about where they come from, um, their background. Hey, they've been the CEO of this bank for 20 years when it was a public entity. These are often in small towns where everybody knows, you know, everybody knows the bank managers. And, you know, and they're, they're big guys in town. And when they go public, some of that reason they go public is because they can make a payday too off of this. Um, but then suddenly it's a shareholder owned company. And so they need to work for the shareholders. And a lot of them don't have that mentality. The boards of these companies are not constructed often in a way that with the quality, the, the high quality that a, a public board ought to have. And you know, you've got uh, lots of local business leaders who know the CEO socially or on a business relationship. And, you know, I talk with this, I talk with Joe Stilwell about this and he's like, you know, you got your car dealer and your funeral home director um, and, you know, all your local business guys who are sitting, sitting on this board and they don't have banking experience and they don't have governance experience. So, um, so I would see um, that mentality as being, you know, empire building, uh, the managers uh, thinking this is my bank and if you don't if you don't want it if you don't like it you can simply sell your stock I think that kind of attitude mm -hmm. is probably the most dangerous and it's the most likely to uh, erode your margin of safety in the business right that all that bank all that capital that's sitting on the bank's vaults um, that's that's temptation for uh, a poor management team right that's the last thing you want to give a poor manager the compensation is too high or do they have like uh, absurd perks or um, what kind of things do you see? Yeah, I mean, it, it could be the perks. Um, Stillwell was, was talking about, you know, uh, you know, it's little by little at year after, you, you know, you'll get the company car and then you'll get the country club membership maybe the next year and then, you know, a, a trip the year after that and things like that. So it could be the perks. Uh, it could be options. You know, one of the typical things you'll see when these when these thrifts IPO is uh, you'll see definitely uh, money set aside or shares set aside for um, uh, retention programs. You know, stock awards for executives uh, uh, in this situation, and those can be fairly substantial. Um, but you know, some of it is just running the bank without regard at all for the returns you're delivering to shareholders, right? I mean, it's, it's not unusual at all to see a bank with 2%, 3% return on equity and the, the bank management and the board of directors being perfectly fine if it runs that way in perpetuity. Um, and that's why, you know, it's so valuable for us as outside shareholders to have an activist come in and say, you know, take a 9%, 9.9% stake in the bank and say, hey, Guys, that's not acceptable. Uh, you need to be doing things that make the bank work for shareholders at large. Yeah, and the 9.9% 9 .9 is because uh, there's uh, regulation that you can go over 9.9% if right. you're investing in banks. But uh, if I'm not mistaken, that changed recently? Uh, in a certain way, it changed. I mean, it, it, 
it changed sort of the, the presumption of control. Uh, you know, I spoke with Larry Seidman and he doesn't really expect this to affect uh, the, the takeover, the consolidation dynamics here uh, very much at all. Um, so I'm just, I, I consider that something of a non-issue. Uh, okay, because it's, you it's, can go to 25 now or? Right, oh. yeah. You, yeah, legally you right. can go to 25 now is my understanding. And um, they had delayed, that rule got uh, uh, discussed late last year, late 2019. Uh, is in, is slated to uh, go into effect in early 2020, but because of the pandemic and such situ situations like that, they've pushed it back. I think it's just now gone into effect, um, and uh, we'll we'll see what happens. Sidemen doesn't expect uh, anything uh, substantial to happen okay. because of it. Yeah, and that's maybe a, a super interesting uh, follow-up question because. Uh, um, yeah, there are, you identified like uh, three major activist investors in the space. And um, um, I would think that if they could go to uh, 25%, that gives them a little bit more uh, a payoff for all the efforts they have to go through and, and sometimes holding for, you know, very long periods. Because as you um, described very, very eloquently in your book, they do not give up so if it doesn't work they just they're like bulldogs because they don't want their reputation to be like if you uh screw with me i'll walk away right. and uh they're extremely tenacious and that costs some returns but it's like a meta a meta thing um yeah uh maybe you could tell us about these uh three people and um how, yeah i thought it was like a really cool story how a sideman got started. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, these, all three of these guys have fantastic stories about how they've, yeah. I mean, just, they're, they're super engaging uh, in terms of how they got into it or, you know, some ridiculous thing that they had to go through um, uh, to, to in, in their activism, right? So, as you said, I spoke with Joe Stilwell, Larry Seidman and Rich Lashley, um, and uh, they all have fantastic stories. So um, the uh, the Seidman story is fantastic. He just uh, he he's originally uh, got got into this um, because he was a real estate guy, and uh, so he wanted to make a, a a deal on a piece of property, and he went to this local bank, Hubco, uh, to get a loan, and. Um, the uh, the bank said, "All right, great, we'll loan you the money, but we want you know we want you to uh, deposit a bunch of money here." And because and it was a big loan a, for them, right? I'm sorry, what? It was a big loan for them, yeah. right? And so um, and take a stake in our bank. And he says, "Great, I can do that." And uh, as he starts to um, as he starts to look at the bank, he says, "Hey, look, they got buildings that they own that are worth more than the market cap of the bank." And uh, you think, hey, you know, certainly as a special situations investor, I think, wait a minute, if we could sell one of those and, you know, uh, buy back stock, hey, look, we can create a great return. And so anyway, um, at some point, the company accuses him uh, of trying to uh, basically become more aggressive. I don't want to get too, too far yeah, in the he weeds kept here. because buying stock and then they, they sued him and... Um, right. I don't know. Yeah. You, it's a long story, but uh... so they they end up suing him, and then he he basically uh, ends up going activist goes activist on them, yeah. and it's a back and forth. And Seidman explains it all, and it gets into lots of legal weeds. But that's he he kind of just uh, he doesn't he stumbles into thrift activism without sort of even meaning to, um, and uh, it's it's such a remarkable story for how he gets involved in this. And Seidman really creates thrift activism. Yeah, yeah, no, well, it was so ironic because he was just buying the stock because it was undervalued and then they got threatened. And that's only what brought, gave him that idea to, to throw them out at, a, at all, yeah. Right, and, and then he's developed this, this great reputation as an activist investor over the last few dozen years, you know, running dozens of campaigns and uh you know it, yeah. as he says 
as he says, it's uh, now now management teams are a little more receptive <laughs> to him when when he uh, when he picks up shares and he wants to have a discussion. Yeah, and uh, I noticed you. Is he the um, uh, activist who's who's got followers that uh, uh, adopt his name as a sort of a moniker of a badge of honor? Right, exactly. Sidemen soldiers, right? A lot of these activists re require because they can only take limited stakes in these businesses, they absolutely require outside investors to say, hey, look, I like what this activist is doing. Um, you know, management hasn't treated me fairly, isn't doing the right things, uh, you know, doing right by shareholders. And so I want this guy to, to come in and uh, bring, bring his director or his, you know, two directors onto the board and shake things up and get the bank moving in the right direction. And so, um, yeah, those activists really require outside shareholders. And um, the, the thing is, is, the reputations of these guys are, are, are strong enough in these sectors that, you know, their mere appearance um, can, can definitely uh, shake things up. Yeah, but, in a, uh, you know, I know I'm only familiar with data in a broader sense, but uh, um, it, seem, it seems to work as a, a catalyst for, for some change. And I think in your in your book, they um, uh, uh, one of these guys describes it himself. Even if he doesn't take any um, like aggressive actions, like proxies, still people start to feel uh, monitored, and you know they'll run the bank better. And even that's a you know it will right. re-rate. Yeah. Right. And so some of these guys, uh, I, I I'll point to Rich Lashley because he he discusses it directly, and he's like. You know, I, I'll, I'll go in and prefer to have a private conversation, set goals with the management team or the board and figure out, you know, how the bank is going to improve. And, uh, you know, if he sees an intransigent board um, or intransigent management, uh, you know, maybe then he feels like, hey, I need to ratchet up the public pressure. So taking it public after that, you know, a lot of these guys would would absolutely prefer to work on a less contentious basis, right? On a, on a more friendly basis. And uh, yeah, uh, a few episodes ago, I've had uh, non gap Mike on, uh, he mm -hmm. writes about corporate governance and he said the, uh, the exact same thing. He used to be in activism and um, um, if things were going well, you didn't hear from them, but uh, yeah, if, if they got pushed back, then the, the letters and the decks came out. But it wasn't per, that wasn't uh, always great a great situation, right? Yeah, I mean there there's sometimes uh, I'll point to Stillwell at uh, First Financial Northwest, right, where a lot of back and forth there. Stillwell ultimately ends up get help helping get the CEO fired, um, and uh, you know installing a new guy and uh, getting getting somebody on the board. Uh, when it breaks out into public. Um, it, it's a whole it's a whole different ball of wax, and Stillwell is absolutely not afraid to go there at all. Uh, one of the stories I discuss in the book is how he he posts billboards around the Philadelphia area, talking about how basically how greedy uh, the the management and directors are, right? And puts the the directors' names on the billboard, right? So all yeah. of Philadelphia driving by can see these, right? <laughs> Um, and then, you know, another great story from Stillwell is uh, he, he does this, he files this 8K filing, right, with uh, uh, Harvard, Illinois Bank Corp, uh, where uh, he takes a picture of the chairman asleep at the, at the previous annual meeting and then just blasts it. Uh, and that gets picked up by national media and, um, you know, and it's this huge thing. And, uh, and he put these, it guys, in his these guys are going to use then, anything yeah. to, 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 to push their agenda. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, th I thought he put that in the SEC filing, the, the picture right. of the guy sleeping. And exactly. uh, yeah, if, uh, it's amazing that he's really funny with these filings. You think this, they're, they're so formal. And uh, if you, if you read them a lot, it's, it's really boring, but then, then this stuff really makes your day if you come yeah. across it. Um, what would you say, like, is, it, is in a general sense, like your favorite time to buy into a story of a thrift? Yeah, so uh, I would, 
I would say in different situations, it could be different, right? So when a bank is fully public, let's say after the IPO, um, let's say on a standard conversion, right? It can be really attractive in the, in the first three or four or five months, sometimes six months. Um, you, you often get that big IPO pop on day one and then it just settles, right? The, the people who didn't sell on day one who might be looking for more come out and they push the price. So you might be able to get it four, five, six percent cheaper uh, in, in, the, in the months ahead. Um, you know, maybe toward year, as you approach year one, the price perks up a little bit because there might be repurchases. Um, and um, so you can see that um, some, some of it is you simply need to, to keep an eye. Some of the dynamics can change a little bit as you, as you, you know, as you go along. And you might get a repurchase and the stock doesn't uh, move up. Uh, you might otherwise get a favorable catalyst and you know the situation you know as investors we're always looking for things that aren't discounted in the price right mm -hmm. we'd like to see a favorable development and then you know price doesn't yeah. go anywhere right so in an activist situation i would say that's ideally what we're looking for you know, like the activist is getting traction he's gotten repurchases he's uh, you know in some cases the, the activist will say hey look i want to sell this bank this bank needs to be sold because these managers cannot do the job right and uh, if you know that's the end game and you see that the activist uh, is doing certain things that uh, that are moving you toward that goal right they're getting some they're getting some of that capital off the bank uh, off the bank's books they are uh, they've got somebody on the board now where they didn't before they whatever um, they have um, you, they're getting traction, right? And yeah. the price doesn't move. That's a great setup. It's, again, especially when you know their their end game, right? And then you know, even for first step conversions, uh, it can be tremendously attractive if you're getting the economics of that business, particularly paid out in the form of a dividend. Um, but uh, and you basically get a lot of that pie by owning only a portion of it. So uh, you know, it can really depend in those in which type of situation uh, you're looking at. And, you know, that's one of the things the book goes through is, yeah. hey, where are you going to find the value at which points in time in these thrifts? Okay, so definitely with experience, you'll get a better feel for uh, yeah. which press releases and uh, filings are more important. Um, yeah, it, yeah. Now, maybe uh, if you have like a favorite thrift, you also already mentioned one. Maybe, do you have another one that you're... Sure, really absolutely. On? The... Uh, <laughs> The, uh, I'm just uh, uh, once again interested in First Financial Northwest, which is a Seattle area bank. Years ago, they were a one branch outfit, uh, but that one branch had uh, basically a billion dollars in assets by itself. And um, still, well, many years, came, many years ago came into that, helped clean them up some. And that's, that's one of the situations I go through in the book. It's a, it's a fantastic situation about activism. And in fact, uh, in some situations where you can uh, see positive developments and not have to pay for them. Uh, in any case, so I like First Financial Northwest trades at about 62% of tangible book value so today. So still going on. And uh, well, Stillwell's out now. Uh, but um, this, like many thrift stocks, the price has come down and... Um, uh, as part of the pandemic, and kind they've of just announced for a second, uh, uh, a second round. Uh, right, and so they're yeah, maybe he comes back. I don't, you know, I don't know. But the the bank has done right. other great things, right? They yeah. they've without uh, an activist presence, they said, hey, look, we're going to issue a buyback authorization for five percent of the stock, right? Uh, so that's something you'd love to see. Uh, when when the bank does it without the prompting of uh, of an activist, so you've yeah, got sixty percent of book value. That's that goes a long way, right? And so they've got equity to assets of eleven percent. Still, you know, still adequately capitalized. Uh, loan loss is just absolutely a sliver uh, in non-performing assets. Um, what else? Um, the in. Uh, I think insiders have been buying there recently. 
there's there's lots to like there, um, and not least that that uh, stock price. So, yeah, that uh, so, sounds great. Um, do do you have another one or um, sh or yeah. how how do you yeah. diversify anyway? Because I if I didn't go into this, but do you buy like a, a big basket or uh, do you focus on your uh, favorite I, ones? I tend. I would say I I I do something of a hybrid, which is uh, the situations that I really believe in, I'll take a larger stake in, uh, but perhaps smaller things where maybe you don't have that activist presence um, or you think there might be a buyback, but it hasn't happened yet. You know, if you're before that one year uh, period, one year threshold, you think it, it, it's trading cheaply and you think they're gonna do the right thing uh, with a buyback. Uh, but you don't really see the activists in there yet. Those, are, I think, are worth a position, and those are ones I add to that. But I definitely tend to um, uh, tend to weight the positions that I think are the most attractive. Okay. Um, let me tell you. Uh, you mentioned one more. Um, yeah. No. Uh, would lo love if you if you still have time. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm just uh, looking at my notes here. Um, Harbor One. Uh, which is a bank. It was a two-step conversion. Um, actually, its origins were as a credit union, um, and that's significant um, because there's literally thousands of credit unions out there um, uh, that could ultimately convert into thrifts if um, regulators sort of wanted to direct the industry uh, in that direction. So Harbor, Harbor One was originally a thrift, then it converted to the mutual form of ownership and then did a two-step process. It did its first step in 2016, 2019, did its second step. Now it's a 100% fully public bank and uh, it's in the Boston area, one of the most highly banked areas uh, in the country, strong economy and uh, trading now at 87% of tangible book value. So it's now trading below its IPO price. They just come out two weeks after that one year threshold, they came out uh, with a 5% buyback authorization, which is exactly what you wanna see these banks do. Yeah. Um, and then they said, um, you know, so what I'm looking for is them to complete that quickly and then, you know, do another one, okay. uh, see how committed they are. Is there you a know, rule and, they can only do like uh, chunks of 5% or uh, do you ever see announcements like 20? Yeah, you won't see 20%. Um, you'll sometimes see 10%. Um, first, uh, sorry, uh, TFS Financial has done a, uh, well, they've done a 10 million. Uh, they've done a 10 million uh, at times, uh, 10 million on a six, 60, million do, 60 million share outstanding. Um, um, but typically they will more now, they'll say a percentage of the total stock rather than a share count. And so uh, sometimes you'll get, most most often you'll get five percent. Sometimes you'll get ten percent. So Harbor One came out and said five percent. Uh, let's see if they uh, complete that and then um, uh, and then announce another. And then ideally, you know, a third one. It's not it's not out of the ballpark. And again, if they are um, if they're trading at a discount to to tangible book or even slightly over, it could still make sense. These it's it's hard to overstate how much cash these things have. And uh, in many cases, it's very difficult for them to put it to work in ways that uh, are effective. And the other thing I'll say about Harbor One is that there's some good, solid uh, insider ownership and that one of the executives has been buying recently at these lower prices. And so, you know, those are all really good factors that make you think, hey, this is going to be um, an attractive investment. And it seems, it seems reasonable that uh, it's buyout bait in a couple of years. So, yeah, it's um, uh, cool. Th thank you. This, this sounds really interesting. I'll have to check them out. Um, in the interest of time, I want to keep it uh, to about an hour um, sure. for our viewers, but I could uh, talk to you uh, about this for, for hours. Um, <laughs> so could I. Yeah, I, I I really I really loved your book. I th it's really uh, making me reconsider here. I'll show it so the re viewers can. Do, am I holding it correctly? Yeah, yeah. Or is it mirrored? In my view, it's mirrored. Oh no, uh, I see it. I see it fine. 
I think uh, you can, you're definitely on Amazon, but uh, is it available in uh, different places? Uh, it's all, it's right now it's available on Amazon. Uh, I've had it available or I've made it available so that uh, booksellers uh, can purchase it and stock it in their stores. Um, I don't know that I've seen that yet, but uh, it's available on Amazon. And uh, you can also order it because it's a print on demand book. If you are in Germany or France or Spain or the UK, and Australia, right? Um, you can print it out. Uh, yeah. it, it can be printed locally and then, and then oh, cool. send. Yeah, and I think so. it's re really great, you know, reinforced uh, for me like, oh yeah, this is a, this is a very interesting um, uh, niche within investing and you give like the guidebook of how to do it and that uh, maybe I'll be, you know, I can stick with a plan and uh, execute. And uh, also, uh, I, um, which is maybe um, a bit of a European viewpoint, but what it did for me was when I learned about these things is that uh, there are similar situations, but not with banks outside of the United States. Uh, for example, when state-owned companies um, in like communist countries convert mm -hmm. uh, to public companies. And like uh, in my country, I came across like an agricultural cooperation and mm -hmm. at some point it did the exact same thing it was a demutualization and because i knew about the thrifts i recognized it mm -hmm. um yeah so so uh it's it's always great to learn about these things and uh yeah yeah thank you so much for uh for writing this and um uh yeah yeah taking the time to do that and uh put so much yeah, effort it, into it yeah thank you so yeah. much i mean it was it was um uh, it, it's uh it was a real exciting experience uh, talking with the talking with the activists, investors, and just digging into the details and sort of let's say more formalizing the the work that I had sort of been doing mentally for many years. And uh, yeah, so this is the result. And I think ultimately, I think it's a great read. It's it's filled with stories about you know uh, about activist investors, about my investments, about how surprisingly difficult it can be to open a deposit account in some of these banks, right? And uh, ultimately, a lot, of, a lot of what you see online only talks about the IPO opportunity. And this book covers the entire range, investing in the IPO, sure, but uh, different, different uh, uh, types of conversions in the public market, where you can find value, how you can use activists to you know, turbocharge your returns the whole thing. And so this is really the first book that does it. Yeah. And I, I think that, that, that may, that's super valuable because really when I did this, um, it takes sometimes years and is when there's no news and you're not super um, experienced with the process yet, you're like, what am I doing here? It's, and, and this really, you know, and I can get your book and, uh, Oh yeah, it's just, uh, I'll have to wait it out. And, um, uh, this is this is how it goes. This, yeah. Yeah. I think it's a roadmap to find wealth uh, with thrifts. I think yeah. that's simply stated what it is. Cool. And do you have like a Twitter handle or a place uh, website or anything where people can sure. connect? Sure. Um, so uh, the website is the the Zen of Thrift Conversions dot com. So just the name of the book dot com. Uh, but uh, I'm on Twitter all the time. Too many hours of the day for sure. At at uh, Jim Royal PhD. Okay, cool. Then uh, I'll uh, leave you to your day. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank and, you so much. Bye-bye. Uh, okay, it's me again. Thank you so much for listening to another episode. Um, since you got this far, I know you at least kind of liked it. Please like, subscribe, share this um, episode. Um, it really means means the world to me and it's you know often i interview people about uh, niche subjects or um esoteric subjects or difficult subjects and it really means a lot to my um uh guests if they know there's really an audience for um uh you know their expertise or their know-how and um um, yeah, so please let them know that you're here and uh, like and subscribe. Um, that uh, helps me to convince them to uh, keep coming back 
and uh, make more great episodes. Thank you very much. Have a great morning, day, whatever. <laughs>